Wine was kind of, to me, hijacked by the aristocrats and the scientists like 60, 70 years ago, and they gave it all this new language and reverie and um, judging shows based on clarity and purity and all this kind of stuff that wine wasn't and farming isn't or nor should it be. That was Peter Windrum, and you're listening to The Regenerative Journey. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and internationally and their continuing connection to culture, community, land, sea and sky. And we pay our respects to elders past, present and future. G'day, I'm your host Charlie Arnott and in this podcast series I'll be uncovering the world of regenerative agriculture, its people, practices and principles and empowering you to apply their learnings and experience to your business and life. I'm an eighth generational Australian farmer who transitioned my family farm from industrial methods to holistic regenerative practices. Join me as I dive deep into the regenerative journeys of other farmers, chefs, health practitioners and anyone else who's up for yarn and find out why and how they transition to a more regenerative way of life. Welcome to The Regenerative Journey with Charlie Arnott. G'day. This week's interview is, uh, episode even, is with Peter Windrum, a good mate of mine, um, currently living up there in Byron Bay, and um, he's moved up there in the last few years to do a number of things, which we do discuss in the interview. Uh, we talk about his formative years um, growing up on the northern beaches of Sydney and his um, his involvement with and, and living on uh, Crinklewood, their family um, vineyard, grape-growing farm, if you can call it that, um, in the Hunter Valley. Um, in New South Wales and the impact of biodynamics has had on his life. I love Pete's interpretation or his definition of biodynamics um, and the way he does it um, in the context of explaining it to a child and it was a wonderful, fresh, uh, very clear um, explanation and and, uh, definition of biodynamics. We talk about um, all sorts of really cool stuff, actually food, his um, involvement in in, uh, retail, um, production of wine, um, his beautiful insights into um, into life and his 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 own regenerative journey, as it were, um, had a really cool time with Pete uh, sitting there on the steps of the farmhouse at the farm at Byron Bay, and uh, I trust you enjoy this episode with Peter Windrum as much as I did. Pete Windrum, we're we're on. Welcome, welcome to the the veranda at the farmhouse at. The farm at Byron Bay. Thank you for having me, Charlie. And it's a beautiful spot and a beautiful afternoon. It's a privilege to be here. It's a bit like we're um, common, bit commentators at the cricket or something, isn't it? I feel that way. And it's about as <laughs> a lot more exciting out there to me looking at the birds and the trees and the lovely rows of vegetables and things in the cricket. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> it. Yeah, a bit more going on. The corellas are, I hope there's not too much. Reese, can you, hopefully you can sort out these corellas <laughs> um, in post. Um, before I kick off, um, Pete, I just want to say, uh, make a note that the other day I signed up as a an ambassador to for the beard season. You know the um, the, the charity, um, yeah. And Jimmy Niggles and his crew there, you know, raising money for um, uh, I guess awareness, cancer awareness, awareness specifically melanomas, and raising money for people to um, have skin checks. And as I oh. <laughs> Didn't turn the video on. <laughs> we won't stop. We won't stop. Hang on, I'll try. Well done, mate. You, that's very. <laughs> I'm glad we worked that out. I'm glad it's we worked the that out. Low-tech operations that it I is. like the best. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Reese, don't take this bit out. Um, it even looks like we're at a, at a, a pavilion at the cricket yeah, in the background does. there. Um, so, <laughs> sorry for the, those watching the video, we, you missed the first couple of minutes. Um, yeah, signed up for an ambassador for the beard season, uh, raising uh, awareness and funds to, for skin checks. And I had to fill out the form at, at, in, on the website and, uh, and it said, you know, who are you, blah, blah, blah. And it said, who's your beard inspiration? And <laughs> guess who I put down? Pete Windrum. Wow, look at that. <laughs> what an accolade. <laughs> it was, I, I can't That's compete. Good. I can't compete. I've man. trimmed mine. Mine used to be down like past my belly button. And I, <laughs> I used to like, you know, be hazardous on the farm driving along and it'd go blow out the window and then get sort of stuck in the door and all that sort of stuff where you go to zip up your jacket in a cold morning and catch it. it was a nightmare. Did you, have you, have you woken up in the morning um, and it's sort of tangled up with your underarm hair and you're sort of struggling to get out of bed or? Yeah, there was bad? a bit of that. And um, being married to a journalist, it was sort of, um, 
dis- I was at a disadvantage because she was working for Good Weekend at the time and wrote a cover story about living with the beard <laughs> and um, waking up with it all covered in drool. And oh, so it wasn't all, com- it wasn't all compliment- complimentary. And, uh, not a single iota. <laughs> <laughs> How rude, man. I know. Um, so that's, there we go. We kicked that off. Now, Pete, um, uh, I, as per the... Um, the name of the of the show, the regenerative journey. I'm keen to sort of dig deep as as far as you want to go, or as deep as you want to go in, I guess, relevant journeys that you've had or you're on, and you know where that has taken you and anything you've learned on the way. So I, I guess a good place to start would be um, who is who's Pete Windrum? Mm-hmm. What well, how would you describe yourself? Because before you just to give you a bit of bit of priming time. Um, you know, your art director, your creative director, your graphic sort of design kind of guy, your photographer, and you're a farmer. And I hope I haven't just answered your question for you, but I mean, what, what are you <laughs> – probably have, moving to the next question, uh, but what, like, how, how, would you, how would you describe yourself? Uh, yeah, I'm all those things, I guess, and winemaker and um, restaurant owner and all that sort of stuff, but I guess – one thing that I've um, put to everything that I've ever done is, I guess I'm a bit of a deep thinker, and um, but I'm also quite spontaneous, um, and they don't normally seem to go hand in glove. And sometimes I'm too spontaneous, and sometimes I'm too much of a deep thinker. But um, you know, I approach creativity to farming, and I approach creativity to winemaking, and I approach a natural kind of dare I say the word, organic element to photography and design and things like that. So I guess everything I do kind of feeds into one another. But, um, you know, I'm a pretty uh, complacent, relaxed individual with an open mind. I um, grew up with a lot of space around me. Um, We had a balance between Sydney, sort of not too far from the surf, and, um, and the country where I spent sort of two or three days every week since I was a baby. Um, so I kind of had a lot of that air and space around me. I guess sort of that's influenced who I am today and probably the reason why I ended up somewhere like Byron Bay. Um, you know, there's a lot of air and space around here. (laughs) And not too far from the surf. (laughs) And, and yeah, and always sort of had some kind of focus on, on nature, you know, like I being in, remember being a little, a young kid, you know, supposed to be doing my homework. I was like nine or 10 and I was in my bedroom drawing like, Greenpeace logos and stuff like that and sort of like becoming a graphic designer before I was one but being focused on the environment and sustainability before I really knew what those two Mm. terms were. So I guess it's a natural path that I was on from day dot. And you grew up in the northern beaches of Sydney. Mm -hmm. Um, So for those overseas listeners that's on the northern side of Sydney. <laughs> my grandparents. I grew up, I spent a lot of time at Collaroy. My grandparents had a, oh, uh, they, they lived there place. for as long as I, I can remember. Yeah, great part of the world. So yeah. so you grew up there, beach culture, I guess, and then wh- when did when did Crinklewood, uh, the Hunter Valley, sort of come into it? Like, Or, or what, what's, what role did it play? What significance? A couple of days a week there, but, like, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a wonderful um, lifestyle, you know? Yeah, I'm... Very, very fortunate of the upbringing for what that was. Um, you know, it was pretty raw, though. Like, we all slept in a tiny little 60s caravan, you know, five of us and the dog and all that sort of stuff. So it was it was pretty basic. Um, but obviously, you know, my mum and dad are tireless workers, and um, I'm going to say Virgos, but I think they might be Geminis. <laughs> um, so they were very fastidious and always wanted to create something really nice and somewhere that was kind of like a real nucleus for the family to – always be around and amongst. Um, so it's quite an emotional investment as much as it was a physical one for them, um, you know, and a fin- financial one to buy a farm while still being in Sydney. But um, my parents bought the first Crinklewood before I was born and um, were putting in grapes when I was in my nappies. So the first, first photos of me are sort of in between the, you know, the grapevine rows when it's just like star pickets and stuff and that was pretty raw. Dad planted two acres i think he had cabernet and chardonnay at the time and he just grew it because he liked drinking wine and he was just curious and i think that's probably a word that i'll say about myself one thing i'm very grateful from picking up from my father is curiosity and i think with curiosity comes like 
the thirst to know and understand and explore and have a go and all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so his was a, a little bit of a weekend hobby that just spiraled out of control and ended up becoming a business. Um, so it did start off as a, as a nice upbringing and a, a fun place to go and learn how to ride bikes and horses and all that sort of stuff. But it was, I guess it was always kind of in me and um, that joy of the country air and, you know, growing up with a dad, you know, driving along and going, oh, smell that, you know, mm-hmm. and you're like, what? He goes, oh, that, you know, the chicken shit or the da da da. You sort of, and you <laughs> grow, from a young age, you appreciate these things and you sort of learn the importance of composting and all that kind of stuff. And that nice symbiotic relationship with um, livestock, like some of my favorite photos are of my dad laying around in amongst the cows, you know, and that's sort of, and I think, not to try and go too far with this answer, but to sort of understand biodynamics, you kind of need to kind of think of yourself as part of that system and not trying to control it. Um, do you want me to? No, I was going to say, let's go there. That was my next question. So, so, so let's, go, let's go there because that's, that's a big part of what we do, what big part of you do or you have done, and, and it's, you know, it's one of those things you can't unknow, this sort of stuff. So when, when, how were you introduced to biodynamics and in, in, in what sort of style and, and, and where, how, did, how does that, how has it been involved in your, in your world? Yeah, I mean, I was borrowing books off my dad's shelf um, before I was, had even considered going full-time on, on the vineyard and the farm. Um, you know, just things like the Buddhism of beetroot and, you know, the 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 Tao of nettle and all these weird <laughs> titles. Um, Broad. Yeah. <laughs> and it was just interesting um, to sort of look at a agriculture, I guess, farming with a just totally different lens of something that I wasn't really that attached to closely. Um, so there was always the interest there, and I was like a, a, a weekend wine warrior with my dad when they were making wine up there and all that sort of stuff. So... I was part of it and I had an interest in it and I really enjoyed the physical work. Like I would go up there from a weekend, a week working in the city and just throw on any old scrappy overalls and boots laying around and just simply want to get my hands dirty. It was such satisfying work and you'd be covered in mud with a big smile on your face. You'd have a beer at six o'clock when the sun went down and it was just such a nice way to spend time. Um, But I was still doing my creative work at the time and in that, uh, a job offer came up in um, India. So Nina, my wife, and I moved to Bombay. And um, funnily enough, I'd been in India only a couple of months, and it sounds very cliche to sort of um, snack on spirituality when you're there. <laughs> but um, I guess being there really shifted my headspace, where I was at and, and what seemed important to me. And what was really important was the work that was happening on the farm without me being there and it was it was really quite um ennobling in a way it just sort of almost came one day and it was a fever that i just couldn't put out so i ordered all of the books on i, I could you know all nicholas jolly stuff peter proctor stuff everything i can get my hands on to read in india so i'd rush home from the publishing house and go you know straight to our apartment in mumbai you know above the slum and just start reading these books on biodynamics and sustainable farming and um then i phoned my parents and i was like i'm coming home and i'm coming to work on the on the farm and they were like no you're not because <laughs> they knew kind of the well i think my dad was quite excited about it but my mum knew what was involved and it was such a big career shift and she didn't want me to do it out of any kind of emotional obligation and you know which is within good reason but um it was the biodynamics that really really spoke to me and thinking about that harmonious relationship between, you know, the, the people and, and the, the produce and, and what you're doing and the work and all that sort of stuff. Um, so I flew home from um, India about a year later and literally got in my car and drove straight to the farm. And I said, look, you don't have to pay me. Um, if I can live here for free, I'll do whatever work I can. And got up to speed with everything very quickly. It was a very, it was a comedic start because... Um, you know, I had uh, real soft hands when I went there on my first day. And so soft- how, how many years ago was that? Just to get a bit of context of was- how soft your hands were. <laughs> <laughs> it was about eight years ago, I guess. Yeah, okay. Um, and, you know, quite quickly I sort of had to fall into a managerial type role just because I was family and there was a lot of stuff that comes with that. There's a lot of boys out there that grow up knowing how to do all these things that we had to do on the farm and I, and I didn't. So I was very aware of not 
um, well, not telling anyone how to suck eggs if I didn't know how to raise them and cook them myself first. So everyone would leave for the day and I'd get on YouTube and, you know, look up how to drive a bobcat, you know, and I'd sit there with my phone <laughs> and just figure it out that yeah. afternoon. So then the next day when they came in, I said, oh, we've got to go on, um, you know, dig out whatever with the bobcat and I, and I had to get, sort of show what I needed to be done first and, and that was my um, learning style on the farm. That'll happen very quickly. So it was a wonderful journey and a really fun journey but it was, like I say, the biodynamic stuff that really, really intrigued me but it was interesting and the thing that I was hoping that we might talk about today was biodynamics and, well, part of it is and also the comprehension of it for people who don't work in it and I think there's so much confusion there and um. I've been guilty myself of lip service of just using other people's words and sayings and, and quotes and things because it feels nice to use the words and it feels nice to talk about something that you care so deeply about. But I feel like I'm guilty as much as so many people of just sort of caring so much about it and getting so lost into the wonderful philosophical touchy feely nature of what it is. And I think if I went into a classroom of like kids under eight years old and I tried to explain what it is that I was talking to journalists about in this quite esoteric language, I'd be at a loose end, you know, and I sort of, so I'm putting my hand up to say that if I can't explain biodynamics to a five-year-old, I don't know it well enough yet. Um, and I feel like that's the next season of my journey is sort of trying to really distill the work on the farm, my passion for biodynamic wine, um, and, and roll those things, we'll take it all back to a point where I can sort of crystallise it for myself because I, I know what I'm talking about, but it's very difficult to explain it to a child. <laughs> well, um, Pete, the largest demographic that we have uh, of our listeners are five-year-olds, <laughs> so this is a perfect opportunity. How, how would you – because, I, I mean, I, I, I was one of my questions is, you know, how would you describe it? So, I mean, I guess as a – as a warm up, you know, how could so it's a great way to do it because I was once asked by the MLA Meat and Livestock Australia to do some videos and, um, and I said, you know, in what style? And I said, well, we'll pretend that they're kids, um, mm. use really simple language. And I felt like a total muppet because, <laughs> you know, duh, 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 and you're speaking slowly and big, well, not, not big words, small words. Um, but it was really valuable because when I went and listened back to them, I actually said, that made sense. Mm. Yes, it wasn't full of all the gum. Give it a crack. No pressure, by the way. No, well, I'll, I'll start with the reason why it's a problem is, um, uh, you know, Rudolf Steiner, you know, obviously the, the father of biodynamics, had all these sayings like, um, okay, sulfur. Sulfur is what the spirit moistens its fingers with into the physical, right? And what does that even mean? You know, is it a gateway? Is it a lubricant? Is it a, and these are the things that we're supposed to understand to then apply to farms. And if you're talking to farmers about putting the chemicals away and getting into this kind of stuff and they pick up a book and read that, mm. they're never, ever going to get their head into it. So I would say to a child, what is biodynamics? Biodynamics is um, an ancient farming method that deals with natural substances and products to benefit and heal and produce things from the land that you're on. But with a nice little campfire note of being aware of what's happening up in the sky and under the ground at the same sort of time um and to put it into a more art director language it's that um elegant ballet between the subterranean and the cosmos <laughs> mate right, you got it right there it's a good thing i just recorded all that it's there forever you don't need to do any more homework mate. no but i mean it's it just feels important to me because um you know, you can get so fixated and focused on something that you care so much about that you actually kind of lose sight of that peripheral stuff that's so important for people to latch onto it. Um, and it's interesting from a wine perspective. Like I was really banging on about biodynamic wine when I was making the wine at Crinklewood um, and the importance of it. And it kind of got bypassed by the natural wine scene because people can kind of, they hear the word natural and they get it. They know that it's it's um, wine that's not messed with in any way, um, but eighty five percent of the bottles that are out there are generally kind of conventionally farmed anyway. So it's it's something that I'm personally going to take a bit of a journey on to sort of try and um, bring the biodynamics back into the focus. And thankfully now there's a lot of people that are 
um, who have really caught the wave of the climate change movement and stuff that have they've cottoned on to, well, pardon the pun, um, soil, the importance of soil, which I know is a passion for you, but I think if there was a way that you can kind of go, these guys care about what's under the ground to make something better and as, as simple as that, other than it's like, you know, cool guy with a cool label with a funny looking bottle of wine, like see past that and see what's really important. Um, and I think there's certain products that are, you know, the, the consumables, well, the, maybe the sort of luxury consumables like a bottle of wine, people care a little bit less because it's a bit like a, I'm in it for a good time. You know, when you're in something for a good time, you don't care so much about exactly where it's from or what it's doing like you might with your eggs or with your milk or with your steak. And if you only have beef once a fortnight or once a week, or whatever, you really want it to be a good organic cut. Um, so, but wine being a bit more of a sort of a folly, it's maybe had a little bit less focus on it. So I feel that's important to, to go there. You, you want to put the focus, and one way you've done that fairly and squarely um, in the world, Peter, is with Supernatural. Can you take us um, to that point? Because I've sort of skipped over the agricultural side straight to the, to the I guess, the retail side of, of your life and, and involvement with, um, with wine. So, to, I mean, why, why, um, why Supernatural? Why was it important? Was it important? Tell us about Supernatural. Yeah, so uh, Supernatural came about from literally my time on the farm and dealing with other farmers and, and winemakers and things. And to not be too long-winded about this, but my heart story as well as the business story. <laughs> Sorry, there's a dog. <laughs> you probably, you probably, you've been copying the Corellas and they've buggered off, thankfully. But there's a couple of dogs tied up beside um, uh, in the veranda here at the farm at Byron Bay, and and I'm not sure what's, I can't see them. I'm not sure what they're doing to each other. I think they heard me say organic steak. In there. <laughs> Thief, be going, Dad, feed me. Whoever Dad is, hopefully Dad comes and takes some wine soon. Um, sorry, mate. Yeah, yeah. So, so supernatural. You're on the yeah. So the sort of um, personal story that led me to opening Supernatural in Byron Bay was. Um, was farming, funnily enough. My, my love of farming, my love of viticulture, and particularly biodynamics, was obviously going to drive me to do something in the sustainable wine world beyond the farm. But it was probably my time on the farm in, I guess you could call it isolation, that sort of got me questioning what I was doing there. And as much as I love the work, it was um, I was quite kind of starved of community. And um, I would go off to these wine shows and, you know, fly down to Adelaide or, you know, wine shows in Melbourne or even just the Hunter Valley or whatever, and you'd get together and it'd be this like real melting pot of energy and you'd talk about your vineyard or your winery or what's going on or guys in biodynamics, we'd get together and go out for dinner and talk about all sorts of fun stuff. But then you'd all disperse back to your properties and kind of just be alone with your machinery or in your winery again. And um, I'm a kind of a sensitive person and obviously that's what drew me to, to biodynamics because to me it's a bit of sympathetic agriculture. But, um, you know, I, I was sort of lonely in a, in a way. And um, so I started thinking, you know, a lot of hours on a tractor and things to think and, um, you know, what's next. And I, I really felt like it was going to be a community as the backbone of what I did. And then it was going to have a wine. So it was going to be some sort of wine business, but centered around community. So I was like, all right, I'm going to go and build a bar and, and build a community around natural wine. And give people a sort of a light journey and a, and a passive experience into what this world of biodynamic wine is. So Byron's felt like a really obvious choice because it's that combination of farming and um, spirituality, dare I say, but these, these things that make people quite open-minded and uh, receptive to these sorts of methods. So, um, yeah, we moved to Byron and opened Supernatural, and Supernatural to me was always going to be something fun and something lively and something that didn't take itself too seriously, which is, you know, talking about the words often used with biodynamics, it's, it's worse in wine. You know, wine was kind of, to me, hijacked by the aristocrats and the scientists like 60, 70 years ago, and they gave it all this new language and reverie and um, judging shows based on clarity and purity and all this kind of stuff that wine wasn't and farming isn't or nor should it be. and it's, time, it's sort of time and it's happening to sort of claw it back again and go back to what the essence of these things are. It's like good soil, good farming, open-hearted, open-minded kind of approach to what you're doing. 
and creating something that is year on year or week on week so different to what it was a year or week before. And that's, that's honest integ- integrity and proper farming. And it's, if people want to talk, talk about that word terroir, you know, that very site-specific um, microclimate thing, you can't have a terroir without farming properly and farming biodynamically. So I wouldn't start with any of this kind of talk when I was running a restaurant or being there on a Friday night. I'd sort of have tasting notes that were purely metaphorical so people could connect with something. Because wine can be quite polarizing. People kind of feel a little bit embarrassed to say, um, you know, a wine variety from Austria or something because they don't want to pronounce it wrong and look silly in front of their friends and things. And this is an age old problem. Um, so I would write tasting notes about dating boys or playing music or like that feeling of running up a hill and that smell of your own sweat or whatever it might be. Um, yeah, that old leather couch or, you know, certain smell that sunlight hits a different thing and people kind of go oh yeah i get that and they don't connect with the wine in any way but they have the confidence to go i want the one that's about picking dandelions and listening to the cure because that's an emotion (laughs) that they feel and they know so they kind of i want to taste that you know and then they'd have the confidence to kind of go oh so what is feigelt you know and i'd start telling them about it and then i could get into a bit of the philosophy and the history and geography and things, and it would all make sense. So then they would walk away really informed, but they kind of arrived at it themselves. Yeah. So, yeah. I have to say it was, it has been the, the many times we've been there has been such a wonderful experience because you know, your staff and, and as you just said, you don't push it on the people. Like you you, you're, you're very good at gauging people's interest and their awareness and what you feel, or you, you sort of tap into it where they're up to in their little little wine tasting journey and their experience and um and the you know the, there's no 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 cut no cutlery you know it's all finger food it's just get in there enjoy it's very it's a, it's a um uh um uh, what's the word I'm looking for sensation it's um primal prim, well primal and it's just sensory you know everything yeah. it's the taste it's the music it's the the vibe um and I read somewhere that it was you know um, the headline on a little article was, you know, why is this bar one of the best wine bars in Australia? Mm-hmm. And that was sometime last year. Um, and you received a, a Wine Slingers Award for Maverick last year, Peter, as mm-hmm. well, for, for good reason. Um, so now tell me where, just in, 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 the, in the context, I want to get back to the agriculture side of, uh, or the, more the hands on the dirt side of dirt and soil, um, of biodynamics in your world. But w- what about, let's, given we're talking about supernatural, you, like many um, uh, retailers and, and restaurateurs, have had to shut their, their doors for some time. What, um, without going into all the detail of what that meant specifically for the bar, but what about you? What, where's, where's the last couple of months sort of taken you in, in your, your journey or your, your thinking or your your sort of, I don't know, whether it's values or whatever. Where, where, where's it sort of put you? Has, yeah. it, has it thrown you or has it sort of placed you gently in a spot? Both. I mean, it's been an expansive couple of months, mostly for my waistline. <laughs> You're a um, very, very handsome, slim-looking man, Peter. <laughs> I'm sucking in. <laughs> um, no, it was... Look, like everybody, it, it had it was a yo-yo. It had days where I was like, "Wow, what a!" When do you ever get a chance for the world to hit pause and to step back and look, reassess your own life and your own business, and have the time to actually kind of readdress where you're going? Um, you know, to quote Charlie Arnott, you know, I, I I tried to see it as a gift, and you know, when you once said that to me, how do you see it as a gift? And it's it's a wonderful thing to sort of put the mirror back on your situation. Um, And I really, I mean, I had a bit of a moment of despair the week that I shut because I was still paying exorbitant rent. I didn't know what was going to happen to my staff. I mean, everything happened very quickly. It was a domino effect, but day by day, new things came up. And then when I sort of finally knew where we were at, which was within the week, I um, surrendered to it. Um, You know, like biodynamics, it gives you sort of like great metaphors because you can't force anything. And the more you learn to work with it, the more power it all has at the end of the day. So, you know, I did a lot of things everyone else did. I cooked a lot. I pickled things. I, um, you know, made some flour wine. I did all sorts of fun stuff that I wouldn't normally have the time to do. And I spent a lot of time with my wife, which was beautiful. But, you know, we got to wake up 
see the sunrise together, which would never happen normally when you're running a restaurant. Um, and it uh, gave me some time to think about some some ideas beyond the immediate business and and sort of reignited um, or refused all of my passions, you know, like the restaurant industry, the wine industry, and agriculture. Um, so I've really – it sounds – awful because I know a lot of bad things have gone down, a lot of people have lost their businesses and lives and things, but to speak purely personally, I've got a lot out of the time. And what, 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 what I mean, and, and I'd agree, I feel very the same way in terms of the pause and the opportunity and the, and the, the reflection. What, what are you going to do differently as a result? Like, is, is there sort of like a, is there a renewed vigour for, <clears throat> for, for Supernatural or for other projects or... Is it you know in the on the, on the domestic at home with Nina? Is it like some you know you're going to be making flower wine every week? Like what <laughs> what are some sort of I guess you know what what I fear, um, not fear. What I what I think about reflect on is you know I don't want to sort of get another two months down the track and go oh hang on what happened and just feel like I'm I'm back on that normality train you know. So I guess how how we, how is it people in your life you go i'm going to do this now i'm going to stop doing that is there any sort of any lessons you've learned from that you're just going to go no never again yeah i mean from the business model itself one that's sort of been niggling away at me and i haven't really arrived at a, a formalized decision yet is imported wine and um you know watching what happened with um climate change and the benefits from the world stopping was such a wonderful experiment that we'll probably never ever get again to see how the, you know, I mean, being able to see the Himalayas for the first time in 40 years and all these things that keep coming up is such an amazing example of what would happen if we did slow down, you know. Um, so one thing that I've been really wrestling with is, you know, I probably should have a 100% biodynamic Australian wine list because my original thought was, isn't it nice to give people this passive education and, and wine tour, I guess, of the world, trying wines from Georgia and Austria and Hungary and all these, and Japan, all this kind of stuff. But, like, they're being flown into the country, you know, or they're being shipped into the country. So that's sort of something that I'm looking at to, to have a little bit more of a domestic focus, I guess. And I think for me personally, it's um, the work-life balance thing is 100% critical. Um, you know, like when I was heading into this, I was sort of like running pretty hot after a difficult summer. I was, I was really acutely watching the news about what was happening in Asia, you know, like I was following um, BBC in London and I remember listening to a um, thing late at night about Hong Kong just collapsing overnight and uh, every single restaurant was shut and that was January and we were still in the middle of bushfires and trying to get a summer, hip, summer, summer businesses afloat. So I came into COVID like pretty red hot and... Um, you know, I did a few tests on myself and I was low in magnesium and I knew that was based around stress and anxiety and all this kind of stuff. So what it showed me was to kind of like, I need more time for myself. And no matter how I emerge from this, I really need to, to have that, strike that balance again. It's, it's hard and we're all sort of martyrs in a way that, oh, it's my own business, I've got to do it and if no one else does it, it won't happen and all this kind of stuff. But um it does. Like this has shown us that the world goes on, people survive, people thrive, people rise up, we get better. Um, so, yeah, that, and I don't want any staff to kind of like bust their guts more than they have and just sort of try and be a bit more calm with how I approach everything. Um, you know, I've started meditating again during this phase, which I'm so grateful for. I was like, going to ask you if you got I, on the show. Yeah, I hadn't. I let it go with, when I opened the, the, the restaurant because, I, you know, I sort of felt weird to – start meditating at 10 a.m. Um, I mean, I know people do um, transcendental and do it a couple of times a day, but for me, it's, it's mornings really only, and that's the time where I sort of really tune in. And I've been doing that um, almost daily. If I miss a day, I sort of make sure I do something, go for a run or go for a surf or something. Um, so that's probably the, the biggest takeaway for me. I want to jump back to farming and, um, again, not, not just yet into the soil and the, the substance, but more... Um, creativity, like as I asked you earlier, there, Pete. You know, you many things, and the, and a, and one wonderful thing about you, you, you are a farmer at heart, because you work hard, you know your stuff, you you produce something that is beautiful. Um, so you if you de you're definitely a farmer in in that sort of well that definition, but you're also very creative. You know, what is it that you think? You know, how can 
and at the end of the day, everyone's creative. Mm. Uh, and it's just about choosing to to express that and how they do that. How how what are some tips you can give our listeners, and not just farmers really. I mean, any there's lots of people in jobs that are creative, but they just don't have that outlet. How, any sort of any tips that work for you in terms of just making sure, you know, you're on the case that that's an important part of your life. Mm. Let's let's just leave it in the in the context of farming. You know, like is there sort of some some um, some things? That, yeah, you can just tell our listeners that that sort of work for you or that that are they're important. Just immediately, probably one of the things that um, comes to mind is it sounds super super simple, but if it looks good, as in if it looks aesthetically pleasingly good, you've done it right, right? And I used to say this on the farm and say anything, you know, like um, a fig tree or a, um, you know, a grapevine. And I'd be explaining the pruning process to the guys on the farm. We get like contract pruners come in and sometimes people just do it for a bit of cash work. And some people love it. They make a living out of like part-time viticultural work, but sometimes it's just a cash job. And so when we'd start pruning, I would say, if it looks good, you've done it right. And I'd get these blank looks and just like, you know, what the hell are you talking about? And I'd demonstrate on a couple of vines. And I'd go, if you just go by theory, as in like two spurs here or blah, 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 whatever, you're going to miss sight. You're going to lose sight of what you're actually trying to create. And it's the same with a tree. Like, um, you know, like these trees, they need to look like a lollipop, you know, yeah. and the insides need to be spacious, you know, like a wine glass. And if you talk, you know, so to me, everything was kind of aesthetically, um, desired in my mind so if i you know was slashing a, a row or whatever i'd want to look back at the end and and not see a, a line you know a, a wonk in the in the in the arc whatever um so yeah if it looks good you've done it right is, is 100 percent of the thing and i think you've got really got to take pride in it. if you've got pride in what you do and you're a proud person you will make it work to make it right you know what i mean um, I was listening to a podcast and I just can't remember who it was and they said that um, they were talking about happiness and that um, it's, you know, the, the, the purpose of life is not to be happy. He said the purpose of life is to um, appreciate beauty and in appreciation of beauty you will be happy. And it was mm. really, I thought it was a really interesting way um, to to frame it up because, you know, for someone to go, what well, I have to be happy to be for, be for feel fulfilled and everything it's like well um feel fulfilled it's like well how do i be happy and in, in, in this yeah it was the simplest thing is like if appreciation of beauty and beauty could be everything around us you know like mm. we don't have to be too you know to put too much of a harsh filter on it so um that was that was quite um that blew my mind actually and and in, and i i agree in terms of a create creative um uh the opportunity to be creative is is yeah whatever feels good Know, mm. what it looked and you know having said that though i'm also cautious um in 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 context of perfection you know you know hamish mckay very well and mm. um in terms of you know he's a biodynamic educator and mentor you know he says and i say we say at our courses you know 80 percent of something's better than 100 percent of nothing you know so this is not yeah. contrary to what you've just said but I, i'm also just think it's important that um you know having the momentum and getting things done and on, on a farm and like that's mm. it's a really important thing i think isn't it you sort of you know y yeah because you're running against the you know the sun you know and time all day long so it's i mean sometimes you just have to run and get something done or sometimes there's a problem you just got to fix it without like you know you can't pull a sheep's head out of the fence poetically you know <laughs> You can try you just don't do it too close to the road Pete. people start wondering what's so going on. i i mean purely they're kind of like methodical tasks you know like um that kind of stuff but um you know but having put, applying a bit of art to it like even plunging the, the must in a in a fermenting tank you know like i would always be like yeah but dip it and dive it and give mm. it a flick you know like mm. what do you do when you're in your kitchen you don't just like aggressively mash something you've got to feel some connection to what you're doing otherwise you're not actually doing it but I, I agree with you about um, when it comes to application of biodynamics, full stop. Like if, you, mm. if you're thinking about it, you're not doing anything. Um, or if you're putting a mood board together, you're not doing anything. But if you're actually trying to have a go and doing a, the bit that you can in your spare time, you don't have a flow home, you're just using buckets or you're just using a broken olive branch instead of a 
broom handle, whatever you whatever you're doing out there, it's one hundred percent better than nothing. Yeah, yeah. I, I definitely agree. Because I think uh, getting back to biodynamics, there's you know a couple of schools of thought in Australia around you know I guess practice, not so much the principles, but but the practice, and you know we are of the of the of the school that you know again eighty percent of something's better than one hundred percent of nothing, and that um, you know so people can get. Um, uh, I was talking to someone about it today. Um, yeah, people can get really caught up in the, in the, in the precision of it, in the term of the you know the time of the day or the, or the you know the time of the year or the the amount you know grams per hectare and that sort of thing. And it's it's really something that's 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 made my in relationship with biodynamics, um, uh, you know, deep and simple. If there's such a thing, you know, is is just using it, just getting it and using it and. And being a little bit experimental and and having reverence for it at the same time as being creative with it, mm. like not it, it's not it's it's a it's not a prescription prescriptive practice, is it? I mean, there are obviously, obviously are some things that you know you you don't put your sore preps out in the morning if you can help it. Mm. Uh, as an example, but there's you know just having how how did you use biodynamics create cre- creatively at Crinklewood? You know, were there some sort of things that you did differently? You know whether it's a type of spray or the stuff you made or was there anything that really made your practice, your use, signature crinkle wood? Yeah. Oh, sorry, just to sort of go back to what you said, I, I totally agree. Um, it's not about the, the, the quantities, you know, because you're dealing with homeopathic stuff anyway. So if I've got a cold, I'm not going to overdose on dandelion tea. You know? But um, <laughs> but the, the timing of when I... I as have, yummy as it is, yeah, as yummy as it is, <laughs> but it, but as the timing of me having the ginger and the orange and stuff is critical. So I do think that timing's important if you can if you have the luxury of time. Mm. Um, but yeah, qu- quantity's not so much. The thing that you said too about um, being prescriptive or being you know one rule fits all, it, it's kind of bogus. I agree with you because. You, you have to have an intimate or develop an intimate, intimate relationship with your farm or your own garden or whatever you've got. You might have one tree in the garden, you know, um, and you are the only person that has that knowledge and understanding of, of what you've got. You know, you've got a huge property down south. I've been there. You know that like the lines in your hand because you've walked it, driven it, and you've, animals have crossed it a million times and you've seen every single weather pattern hit it at every t- single time of day. So you're the only one who knows, not Steiner or, or anyone, um, what to do when on that property. And it was the same at Crinklewood because um, I, I lived there literally sort of pretty much smack bang in the middle of the vineyard. All my waking hours and even the, you know, um, in the dark I was, I was out there doing something and I, and I just developed a, um, a real sensitive connection to what was happening at that place. Um, and to me, because I, I, I wasn't coming in at 7 and leaving at 3.30, I had the luxury of time to sort of to spend with it and, and, and get, it, get that deep connection with it because if you just, it's 10 past 3 and you're a contractor and you're fanging around on the four-wheeler just getting out there to, to get out the door at the end of the day, you're not going to have that um, simple old school footsteps on the farm kind of of feeling and understanding and that's the real science of that just that connection there so the things that we did differently we did a lot of compost teas we were big into composting um when my old man planted the vineyard he you know um put in about i don't know three thousand ton of compost or something just to build up and level the Mm. level the earth to put it on so it was impressive start but um, you know, you can have too much of a good thing as well, as you know. You can <laughs> you can kill things with kindness. Um, we, you know, we kept it pretty simple. Um, I experimented with all sorts of the preps, but really we were pretty religious with the compost preps um, and 500, 501. Um, you know, we had quartz that we harvested from the river, which was cool, so we ground that up ourselves. But it was literally, I think, that the thing that really worked was um, – knowing what the rhythms of our property were, and, and I really felt like I knew them. I remember calling my dad about things, and, you know, he'd spent a lot of, lot more time up there than me. I was like, oh, I've just noticed this happening, and it doesn't seem normal. And he'd kind of go, oh, yeah, I don't know if that's right, or, um, you know, that's odd, you know. So mm. um, the other thing that 
you know, it, it's that sort of intention behind things. And intention's a bit of a woo-woo kind of word with, with the work that we do. But I, I dabbled a bit with um, radionics. I know it's a little bit off the curve from, from BD, but we, I put in a, um, a broadcasting tower at this really pivotal part of the farm and I went off to learn dowsing and all this kind of stuff. And I had a, a guy come in and douse it and I doused where I felt like the energy was right because I felt like I had a pretty good understanding of the energy of, of our farm. And I, hold a, I held a, um, a winter solstice meditation um, pre-harvest on this site because I just felt like it was right. And anyone who liked our farm or neighbours or wine club members, they all drove up and they did this group meditation with us. And it was quite powerful to do it at sunset. And um, anyway, when I went dowsing around the property, I ended up pretty much within 10 feet of that spot. And I'd left a sandstone block there from that day. And I got this guy down who drove six hours to come to the farm and douse it for me to find out exactly where to put the, the broadcasting tower. And um, he landed on the same spot. Mm. And we put it in, and in the, the two years that followed that, we had the worst years ever with rainfall that the Hunter Valley had ever seen. The whole valley was full of rot and mould. and So so a lot of rain. Uh, a a lot. Huge, yeah. <laughs> more more than normal. Because when people say the worst year of rain, it's like, oh, that's not much. Rain. Oh, sorry. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> for, a, um, for a grape grower, worst is like too well, much. Well, worst is too much rain in yeah. summer. And, yeah. um, you know, th- think of... Um, you know, moist, moist underarms sort of thing. Um, <laughs> so people were, were dropping their grapes, not picking a single thing, mm-hmm. down 100% or down like 95%, like everywhere, two years in a row. We had two of the best years that we had ever had. And you can't attribute that to the biodynamics or to me and this sensitive woo-woo relationship with the farm <laughs> um, um, or, or the radionics, but it's like, I remember when I put the images and, and the boundaries into that map, I just did the vineyard and I, and I did a lot of warmth and I put in a lot of, you know, um, warming supplements and pictures of heat and energy and all this kind of stuff. And I kind of have to believe that it worked. Something and new. and that's just intention. And I think if you – so if you're doing anything with BD, yes, you don't have to do it all or do it at the right timings and stuff, but I really believe if you believe in it and feel it, it'll work. There's a difference. Yeah, there's a difference. Who, who was the who was the fellow who put your tower in? Remember what? Um, Lloyd Charles or Hugh Lovell? No, it was Hugh. Hugh, Hugh. came and put it in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 We've got one at home, and, and, and Lloyd Charles put it in. Um, I met Lloyd through the BAA, Biodynamic Association of Australia, and lovely fella, and he, um, uh, oh, Naranda, I think, um, um, Lloyd's from, and he, interesting you say about the site, you know, we we had a, um, a one of the fellows working for us, he doused this, a, a spot on a map. Um, Lloyd um, had a map and he doused a spot, and then the next day we went out and actually found a spot, and these two got the same spot. Um, and we put a, put the radionic tower in. We'll, we'll put some note, some little link in the show notes um, about what that's, a bit more detail about that, but we um we put, put preps in. Hamish Mackay was at home there back in March. We put some um, 501 out in the mornings and 500 in the afternoons. And we um uh, we shot a fox the other day. So the mm. fox is going to go in there too. Mm. He's going nice. to go in the tower to try and move the foxes on from uh, from Hanamino. But back to your point about where you found the spot. I mean, it's interesting that you know I wonder whether the spot was 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 a spot and you both found it. You and your the other fella, mm. because of what of the, the 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 gathering that had taken place on that spot, or whether and and whether that had created a bit of an energy uh, residual energy, and that was where they found, or that gathering, and you probably tell us the gathering was put there because that was the place that we you know the group innately went to because there was already a, an energetic thing there, you know, whether they were attracted to that mm. in the first place, or whether the the, the, the dowsers and yourself found it because of the energy you put there by the, by the group. Was it sort of the chicken or the egg? I don't know. Have you got any sort of views on that in terms of hmm. that residual energy sort of stuff? Probably like a sort of a combination of both, you know, because if you're looking for a peaceful place to meditate or to feel calm, you're looking for that grounding energy, aren't you? Um, and I guess it's a similar thing for the, for the tower because you're just working with this like sort of just – just surface level stuff. It's all very kind of like earthing. Um, 
But I think just spatially, it just sort of things just feel right, and it's very hard to sort of put words to them. Like it's just kind of like a, you know, like something settling into a bowl. You know, like that's where the energy sort of like just resides. Um, and yeah, maybe we were both we were all looking for a similar feeling. That's probably why we arrived at a similar place. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, you definitely not weren't looking for anything kind of like exciting. Or like <laughs> cha- chaotic. Or Where are you gonna have a rave party? <laughs> yeah. The like the splendor in the grass of um of the of the Hunter Valley. Yeah. I think it's a, it's a I mean it's such a, a an un, you know, subtle energy stuff. And we've done some work with um uh, Patrick McManaway um and just that it's it's such an untapped um tool, isn't it? I mm. think that you know and, it, and it's I mean. It, there's not many there's not many farmers that tap into that, you know. And I guess, mm. you know, in the world, world of regenerative agriculture and biodynamics, that's it's um, not necessarily that is the tool of choice, but it's more it's it's all part of the, of a of a similar um, uh, box of tools which are not all based around science, not all prescriptive, mm. and not all objective, isn't it? You know, that's sort of one yeah. of the wonderful things about this space. Yeah, that's so true. I was thinking about that on the way down here this afternoon, and. Um you know, we're, we're so okay with um, acupuncture and, and Reiki and all these things, right? And a little bit of what that is is kind of like a terrestrial acupuncture-style thing. You fi- you're finding a nerve point or a trigger point type thing, you know? And there's a couple of interesting wine guys in, um, in the Loire in France that actually move rocks and things around their farm to kind of like, you know, um, calm certain energies and thing. And, and that would sound completely off the charts to so many people. But if you went to a your GP and you were complaining about, you know, some niggling pain and they said, oh, you've got to go and get some, some needles in your chest, you know, the first time you'd heard that, that would sound equally as crazy, mm. you know. And I think there's a lot of that sort of like uh, spiritual connection people try to draw between your farm and your body. But I think it's a or and your mind, but I think it's a very lovely place to try and put your thought and to try and wrap your head around it because if you think about the two in a similar way, it won't feel like a paradigm shift in any way. It'll just feel like natural. <laughs> well, um, um, Patrick, he talks about, you know, he, I guess he calls himself a land, landscape, well, he practices landscape acupuncture. You know, that's mm. one of his things, you know, one of his practices where he's looking for black water or there's, there's certain residual energies he's trying to move on. But I, I just find it, Absolutely fascinating. Um, I had another question for you based around that, Pete, but it's now um, it has left my <laughs> soft, mushy brain. Um, tell me um, what? Oh no, I remember now. It was I'm, I'm I, I love wine, and I'm you know I've sort of dabbled with the idea of putting some grapes in a burrower, burrower. and Dad always had a sort of a, a, a you know he's curious to do that as well. So it's it's quite it's a bit of a passion of mine, um, you know what? So so I I love the idea of of farming in that style, you know, growing grapes, producing a wonderful thing, and I just would love more wine makers and grape growers to use biodynamics because I just mm. see I can taste, and that's one of your things is it's, it's just the taste of it. What I mean for for those. Um, Grape growers, winemakers, listening. I mean, what are some of the what are the sort of the things that you you could suggest that they think about, or some tips, or some trigger points, or um, what's that thing doing again? Phone eye for storage is full. Oh, <laughs> oh no! You're it's just getting full. juicy. I'm <laughs> oh, just getting because I oh, will put that up. It's right. Um, the podcast, the audio is the important thing. Like, what, what? How? Like, how can what would you say to them to sort of make them feel a little more comfortable about considering it? You know, anything, experiences you've had? Mm. Uh, look, it's a it's difficult area because a lot of people are just against it um, or don't feel like they need it for one. Um, a lot of people see it as marketing, which is real discredit to it. A lot of people see it as um, too time consuming and all that kind of stuff. But I I kind of feel that if you want to stand behind what you're producing and what you're doing, uh, you should be doing it this way because it's the only way that you're going to sort of carve out a true essence of what you're growing and and, and your little patch of earth. 
And if you want a wine to taste purely of where that grape is grown in that soil that belongs to you and have any kind of point of difference, you should be giving this a go as well. Um, and I think you can, you can really kind of taste a, an essence and a soul of place. Um, and, and you should. And you're sort of cheating people out of that if you're just grabbing grapes from anywhere and just whacking them around with sulfur in a winery and then, you know, bottling it and sort of hoping that that's enough. And I think you should also, if you're involved in and this, this is where I personally stand, don't get any hate emails mm-hmm. about this, but um, <laughs> you should be in agriculture for the right reason. Yeah. You know, and I think a lot of people, um, their second, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth generation, I met a guy the other day who's a seventh generation dairy farmer. And I take my hat off to anyone who's a dairy farmer because it's mm. such brutal hard work. Um, you know, I can get up at 3.30 to, to spray silica every now and then, but doing it, <laughs> doing it every day of the week, <laughs> eight days a week, that's, <laughs> that's hard graft. Um, For eight generations, seven generations. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's sort of, that's it's kind of different. But if you're yeah. sort of, if you're into it to sort of, to produce something that you hope to sell and tell a story around um part of your belief system should be that passionate responsibility about your patch of earth that's that's lovely and it's and it is it's it's about for me it's about um simply having a relationship with your landscape and your your um your the nature of your landscape and patrick talks about the nature of your business the intelligence of your business Mm. you know there's more to it than just oh that's a you know balance sheet and a you know you've got the financials and you've got the the emission statement and that's all that's sort of all your business plan it's actually that there's a that entity of your business has an intelligence you know Mm. everything does um that's a whole nother story and and i'm i'll be interviewing patrick um later in the year pete Mentors, who've been who've been some of your mentors? Um, quite a few. I think we've talked about this this fellow in the past, but um, John Priestley, who is a um, oh, he's multiple generation mm. um, citrus farmer, and he wasn't too far from where we were in the Hunter. Um, he was great to me because he was one of those people that said, "Here's my phone number. It's my home number." Call any time you want. Um, if the missus answers, I'm not too far. She'll just tell you a story and wait till I get inside to answer any question you've got. And I, I would ring him, and it was wonderful because he was one of those people that really had the, the childlike response that we talked about before, but in such a practical, informed point of view because he'd done it, you know, practical application, being able to explain it in a way that made pure sense. Um, you know, he was the one who told me about um, our horse being flighty and he's like, oh, it's just magnesium deficiency, you know. Mm. He's like, what else do you want to know? And and I just go, oh, okay, while you're there. And I just had this long <laughs> 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 Um So he was a wonderful influence early on for me because it was just nice to sort of have that real, real sounding board. And, and, pra- and very practical Practical, too, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, not a mentor, but the one of the, Probably the biggest inspiration for me was the um, Loire Valley winemaker, Nicolas Jolie. He's 80 years old now, but um, he talked about wine and viticulture in a way that was just pure passion and poetry. It was just a joy to listen to him talk and explain certain things. And it wasn't just um, fancified nonsense or gussying something up to, to sell a bottle. It was he believed in that, that rhythm. Of, and the energy of growing grapes and the personality and how they express and communicate things to you and all this kind of stuff. And that just flipped a little on my mind and it really, it just proved to me that was anything is acceptable and anything is possible. And having that broad um, brush open mind is, is so potent and so exciting. Um, so those two guys, for, for, you know, at, at polarities for those two very different reasons. Pete, if you um, if you could have a oh, and Charlie on it as well. Sorry, <laughs> I was just politely waiting. For that. I was just like, I don't know, I didn't know I was going to say that. I was just no, I am serious. No, Charlie on it is a mentor as well. <laughs> Pete, stop it. Checks in the mail. Um, Pete, if you had, uh, if we had a, a sign you could put on the side of the highway just out there in the Pacific, 
that is the Pacific Highway, I think, um, at Byron Bay here, what would it say? You had the opportunity to, to, to state something, ask a question, you know, make an impact on those drivers, driving, you know, something they go, wow, that was awesome. Was there any, anything that comes to mind? Well, the thing that I'm sort of intrigued by at the moment is, um, um, is the pledges that we should and we will in certain places have to take when we visit somewhere, you know, like take Bhutan, for example. You've got to sign a pledge um, to contribute and to acknowledge and um, understand what's happening there and why they only take certain tourists in and all this sort of stuff, and Tibet the same. Um, so we, we race around, um, you know, shoplifting experiences basically and and byron is no is no, no stranger to that because people race in here and and you know i've been guilty of it my whole life before i, I now call myself a local <laughs> <laughs> you're 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 of the bengalese the bengalese population yeah 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 yeah. <laughs> the, the linen mob <laughs> <laughs> no linen today linen undies probably yeah yeah, yeah. oh they are they're they linen pants they are too yeah, well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, enough about Bangla. <laughs> um, you know, some kind of, I mean, I, I, okay, what does the sign say on the way in right now? Chill out, cheer up, slow down. No, slow, slow down. Slow down, cheer up, chill out. Chill out. Yeah. And, and that's brilliant. But if you could almost, if the road was, road was wider, get out and sign something to promise to do that while you're here. You know, or, or to to learn about some of the history here, the mm. indigenous culture here, and and the agricultural culture here. That so is this this land is farming land. I mean, yeah, it's got wonderful point breaks, but it's farming land that we're on, and it's it's really um, wonderful, fertile indigenous land. So that we need to kind of, you know, I went to the march last Sunday, and it was Saturday. It was beautiful, and it was such a powerful moment. You know. More than fifty percent of the population marched that day. You know, more than in the New York march. Um, there was a lot of people there. Fifty percent—that's unreal. Well, five thousand. Um, really? Yeah, and uh, in a town of nine thousand, I thought that was pretty powerful. But I just—I think having a bit more of an understanding of where you are and what and what you're standing on. So, what would I say? Um, I'd probably keep that slogan at the front gate. It's there, but sort of create some response to it. Mm. Yeah. What, what did, did you did you do that while you were here? Every time someone left the town, they'd have yeah. to pass a tollway and they'd have to yeah. prove, show me a photo of what you did. That yeah. was good. Yeah. Did you, did you chill out? Yeah. Or did you just Instagram the whole thing and then, <laughs> you know? And then order, I like what you say, that hij, hijacking, what did you say, shoplifting experiences. Yeah. That's kind of, that's great. Yeah, there's a fair bit of that going on. Yeah. I'll have to make sure I don't do that either. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, um, I've been fortunate to travel quite a bit with my wife's work. She travels professionally for work. Um, and one of the things that I love most, like I had an argument with my dad about politics on the phone this morning, and, um, and I just basically Who said... Who won? Yeah. <laughs> well, him, of course. <laughs> right. um, not an argument. We just have... Um, we're just on slightly different sides <laughs> of the middle. And, um, but one thing I said was, yeah, it's important to get your news from multiple sources so you can sort of start to, you know, um, shape your own opinions and your own understandings of what's going on. But there's nothing more important than that than, than travel, like to me, is because going and seeing something for your eyes, like I, when I went into, like, say, Palestine, I was felt so lucky to have seen it, to sort of grasp in some small way what really has been happening and what should be happening and not to get political on it. But I think one of the wonderful things about travel is you, you do homework. And you research things and you learn things. You learn things about culture and history and art and farming and all these things that have gone into this wonderful place before you've set foot there. And I think there should be more emphasis on that for whatever we're doing. So there is none of this shoplifting of experiences. So you walk away enriched by that mm. experience. I guess it's a reverence, isn't it? It's, it's, it's stepping into a place mm. and whether you've done the history or not, um, I guess it's nice if you have, if one has but to actually really immerse yourself in the culture. We went to Italy for a couple of months last year, which was just amazing. I'm glad it was last year, not this year, <laughs> <clears throat> and um, about this time. And got there and wished I'd done, done more homework, but, but did we resolve ourselves that we would just, and the way we planned it was just to immerse a week at a time in a different spot, little village. We covered a fair bit of country in, in, in eight weeks. But that was was profound in that we really did absorb it and we had reverence for, you know, Ange, my wife, Italian, 
so there was that connection um and and there was some expectation as well you know? mm. um, I have to say we're at the farm at Byron Bay I know I keep plugging it for a very good reason and the guys here the three blue ducks ha- make the best salads in the world um uh and I say the world because and you know, curry chicken pie and oh tequila <laughs> and the Portuguese tarts yeah. how, how good are they um, and you know Angie and I would be sitting in his amazing little you know um, restaurant in Rome or some know, some some beautiful place Sicily somewhere and just be craving a three blue duck salad because <laughs> <laughs> I love Italian food but they cannot make a salad look at that isn't that cool? beautiful formation formation there the, the V. What are they? They're um, maybe ibis. They look like ibis. Too far. That's away. unreal. Nice, isn't it? <clears throat> um, Pete, uh, we I'll probably have to wrap up because we're sort of hitting just over an hour now, and the sun's setting um, here. <laughs> I have to ask you, um, Elton John. Mm. Elton John. Yeah. You was it fair income? You you did a he was at a talk you did or a thing? Is that or did I make you? Were, Tongue in cheek. No, I. <laughs> Am I so, going to regret asking? Um, no, 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 no. Tell no, no. us. Um, or was it hush hush? There was no Elton John. <clears throat> there's an Elton, There's two Elton John stories. The the only advice I got from my old man when I was a little kid sounds. This is in the eighties, so by the way, so excuse it being not so politically correct. But um, he <laughs> said, um, "Don't drink and drive, because you might chip your teeth." <laughs> And one day you were like Elton John. And the third thing, oh, no, and the third thing was you're only as big as you think. But they were three bits of advice I remember getting at different times when I was a little kid. Anyway, turns out that I, I did end up liking Elton John. No, I, I did a, a talk at um, uh, in Byron to the Paradiso group about um, morphing careers and shape-shifting and evolution and stuff with what you do. And... Um, there's a line that I started with, and I, th- I can't remember what it was. I think they said in the, in the film about Elton John, it says, um, you've got to kill the person that you were born to be in order to become, to become the person that you want to be, right? And that's all about, you know, stripping away your old self and just throwing on the mask and being someone different. And I, to, to someone that isn't a performer, I think that's sort of bullshit because everything that we do informs the next things that we do and it's a shame to like to remove that and pull that away from the fabric of yourself i think it's really really wonderful like if you've been an accountant and you've been doing it for um you know a construction company you can take all those things that you've learned from that and apply it to like um, a dairy business or something or and i think we get so um boxed in with where we should be and oh, no, I can't change careers, or oh, I don't know anything about that, or oh, people studied that for 10 years and now they're working it professionally. And I think that's such a shame, you know, that we have to kill our old self or stay the old self and, and, and not evolve. So that's what that was about. So I didn't have lunch with Elton John. No. <laughs> I just oh. paraphrased, I paraphrased a line that someone used about Oh, because it said, I, I must have so misread that because I thought it said something like, you know, in the presence of Elton John or or something, and I there wasn't a photo of him. I thought, oh, he must be in the crowd there with his, <laughs> with his mates and whatever else. <laughs> and I thought it was in Melbourne. I thought I thought I had it all so right. I went, wow, he's met Elton John. Pete Elton <laughs> went to him to Pete's talk, especially just to hear about I don't know metamorphosis. He's, Elton, Elton's done oh. a bit of that himself, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, he did. He just doesn't want anyone to know about it. Does mm. he? I'll give out his phone number or something. So like, I'm on hush money. <laughs> You probably got it. He's probably on speed dial. <laughs> um, Pete, what else did I have here? I we've covered so much. Um, is there any um, one last question? I guess hurdles, hurdles. You know, in in whatever form they were, learnings, hurdles. You know, or, or advice to others, whether they're farming or they're entrepreneurial or they're creative. Is there any sort of I don't know. It might be a favourite quote, or a, or a, or just little tips of advice, or thing, little guideposts that you use in your life. Is anything, any little gold nuggets you can you can throw on the table for us? Yeah, I think that probably the the hurdle that I've had with everything that I've done is um, uh, trying to appear that I know what I'm doing, or being too proud to ask the questions, and having that. Ego is a real stumbling block. 
and also the creation of, of friction. If I've ever had any friction with people, it's because they have either, either been like myself or, or I've been too proud to actually ask the questions or admit that I don't know because I've been so quick to, to race to the front of whatever I've been doing. Sometimes that's been a problem because I haven't ha allowed myself the time to kind of like sit with it and kind of go, oh, yeah, and, you know, pick up the phone another 10 times to John Priestley and sort of, you know, take my time with it. So um, I probably haven't gotten rid of my ego, <laughs> but I've learned to kind of keep it in check and I've learned to know how to use it and how definitely when it's doing me a disservice. Um, and that's applied to farming or art direction a long time ago or running a restaurant or, or any of that sort of stuff because you, you never know everything and and probably the, the the best piece of advice that i ever got was probably 25 years ago from a friend who lived in england and we were doing some design work together and um he just turned to me one day he goes oh um you've got to know what you know and i went hmm? and it took me like i was cycling home that day and i was thinking about it and i was like it's the best piece of advice i've ever been given because if you want to be a um, you know, a ceramicist or something, and you don't know where the good clay comes from or how to harvest it or how to build your own kiln or how to make bricks or, or the history of, um, you know, ceramics in Iran or, or what the first pot looked like and, and all that kind of stuff and temperatures. And if you just kind of get into it and skim into it and want to kind of have a surface level appreciation of that, you'll never know. Mm. You'll never be um, a voice of reason or someone that people go to for anything. And, and you won't get that richness out of it. It won't provide you with what you need. Um, so I, I use that really for everything because I, you know, I love good conversation, but I, I hate nothing more than throwaway remarks that, you know, sometimes I've, I've said them myself about something, but um, I love getting into a conversation where I've actually done my homework on things and because it's so nice to have a, you know, robust conversation about stuff, no matter what it is, but it, whether it's your work or, or current affairs or, or whatever it is, or you know, um, finally trying to get to understand yourself because your wife's been begging you to sort of figure it out. <laughs> you too. <laughs> <laughs> That's a work in progress. <laughs> I don't think the sexes were designed to know, to work each other out, which is kind of, you know, leaves that there's an air of friction. <laughs> I was going to say that sort of uncertainty or that spontaneity or that, um, you know, bit of greyness, that's okay. There's, yeah. there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's that gap for creativity there and, yes. and exploration. Always room for improvement, you know. It's yeah, a, totally. We're not too proud to, <laughs> you know. Um, I think that's great. And um, I guess um, that's probably where we should leave it, Pete. I think I had something else to add to that, but there's probably – Probably really no need. Um, I, I think that you like, sorry, the one last thing no, that I'll, I'll say is um, people need to ask more questions, mm. you know, like if you, kids are going to the butcher shop with their mum, like ask the guy, you know, wh where were those cows from? Where was that sheep from? Who's the farmer? You know, like um, Matthew Evans used to be quite good on that, like three degrees of separation from the, the paddock or the, the animal or whatever to the plate and things. And I think, we need to put more pressure on the people, you know, and I think it's, it's got to start in the homes and filter its way out. Um, and I think that would help the same with, with, uh, with, with wine, you know, like Nina used to go into bottle shops and go, oh, have you got anything um, biodynamic? And they go, oh, all wine's biodynamic. And she was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I just think that's a really, really simple thing. So, and that's the subtle way that we can put pressure on and start from the bottom to get you know the the peop more people doing the right work. I think that's a that's um I can't agree more. You know, asking that's all um, I, um, you know, I I always emphasise to people is ask better questions because you'll get better answers, and then that that incites more curiosity. And I think that's a really healthy it's a really healthy place to um to do anything from, isn't it? You know, constant mm. a hunger and a and back to your comments about you know the you know. Um, what was it again? Knowing, knowing, know what you know. Know what you know. You know, it's mm. about being an artisan in something, and if you're really passionate about it, and really, as you say, having reverence for the topic or the, or the the, the job or the, the the trade or whatever it is, 
And and it's not necessarily about being an expert. It's just having, you know, um, yeah, a relationship with that with that mm. with that trade or that, uh, as you say, that that um, uh, sort of, you know, um, um, the 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 hobby or whatever it happens to be, because that 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 creates fulfilment. You know? mm. And then get back to our you know comments about beauty and and you know making beautiful things and appreciating the beauty in that and everything mm. you know like. Everyone has a different eye, and that's a wonderful thing, mm. you know, I think. You know? mm. um, and that's, again, that's why um, that, makes us so, that, that, that makes us different, and that's, that's a good thing. You know, we've all got different opinions, and you, know, you and your father have different political opinions, and that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there was one lovely thing I heard recently. There was this deceased now, but this beautiful Irish poet called John O'Donoghue, and he used the word religion, but I'll replace it with spirituality. But he says, spirituality is the gap from longing to belonging. And I thought that was so apt when it comes to like the right way of farming and right mindfulness and all that kind of stuff. Because if you have a connection to it, you are it. You embody it and, and you enthuse it and you inspire it, you know, all that sort of stuff. So that's a deep way to finish. No, that's great. <laughs> well, I, I guess it's, you know, that, that leads me, and we, we, we better wrap it up, um, to I guess the dare I say spirituality of farming, you know, and, and having again it comes back to that connection with your vocation, you know, your because um, in farming, you know, the the job, the the business, the 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 family, the life is the one thing, isn't it? You know, mm. and if you're if a farmer is not, and I'm I'm not saying one's right or wrong, I'm just saying from experience, you know, if if a farmer if one is not deeply connected to their to their farm and what they're doing like it's 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 hell you know mm. it's really it's it's tedious it's stressful it's there's no fulfillment and you know there's a real lack of purpose because there's just not that um you know appreciation of the beauty of farming i mean whoever talks about their i love the idea of being in love with your farm you know and the romance i mean no one uses the word romance and farming in the same mm. sentence well not not many i mean some do i mm. guess but um, I think that's something. Hopefully, there's something in that for all of us. Yeah, I, I agree. 100. <laughs> <laughs> we better wrap it up because it's getting dark, and I get scared in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. no, I don't. I'm a tough guy, <laughs> Pete. That was so um, in, um, inspiring, informative, insightful, and I really appreciate your time, mate. And thank you very much for having me, Charlie. It's an honour. Well, look, it's um, mentor, mm. Charlie. <laughs> Checks in the mail, Pete. <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, fantastic chat with with Pete there at the farm at Byron Bay. I love his insightful definition of biodynamics and the way he so succinctly um, defined it, uh, as one does with a definition. Um, my talk, talking about defining people. That's a crazy segue. Um, my next interview next week is with Dab- Darren Robertson. Darren is uh, one of the three blue ducks. There's not just three blue ducks. There's about five of the boys um, doing fantastic things, making big waves in the Australian culinary scene and have, have been doing for some time. Um, I speak with Darren about his, uh, his growing up in the UK and moving out to Australia and his, his rise to, uh, dare I say, stardom um, in the Australian culinary world and also globally. Um, had such a really cool sit down with, with Darren, really relaxed guy, and um, we both enjoyed the time we had out just to sit and chat there at the farm at Byron Bay. And uh, that's next week, so set your watches, put your ears on, tune in. This podcast is produced by Rhys Jones at Jaeger Media. If you enjoyed this episode, please feel free to subscribe, share, rate and review. For more episode information, please head over to www.charliearnett.com.au.